Hey guys, I have a little bit of clamping left to do, then I'm going to start making some patches using this salvage mahogany veneer. I found one really handy feature on these spring clamps is that the clamp jaws actually rotate and it works out perfect. So I was having a hard time figuring out how to pick the clamp this little lip here. Well, there you go. You rotate one of these 90 degrees and then the other one can sit full on this side. Does a great job of squeezing that real tight. Another way to do it is with these more traditional wood clamps. You can actually set them at an angle so one extends down further than the other and you get the same effect. You can bite onto a shallow lip. Alright, on to patching now. I'm no expert, but I've read up on a few techniques and I've tried a few and I think I'll be using uh, maybe all of them on this project. So, for example, on just a little chunk out like that, a little bite out, one technique is to use wood filler. Get something that's close in color, maybe use a little stain, and then you can use a knife blade and make little grain lines in it and then fill those pores in with a darker color like the grain filler and you can get a pretty good approximation of actual wood. Otherwise, if it's uh, deeper chunks out, you can make some patches. I uh, would not recommend trying to just patch a little piece like this if the edge is all chewed up. better way to do it is to take a knife and just take off like an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch on the whole length. Cut out a new strip of veneer and glue the whole thing. Similarly here, could try to cut a little patch in for that corner or use some wood filler or just make a clean cut all the way down to this break here and put in a new piece. The reason for that is the most visible thing when you patch veneer is when it's cutting across the grain. Seams with new veneer going with the grain, if you do a nice tight job of gluing it, are going to be invisible. When you got something at an angle, especially if it's at a right angle, it's going to be very visible like these intentional lines here. So in this case, though, these lines do, do me a favor so I can cut it off and just stop here instead of having to go the whole length. So the worst or the largest areas are on this side are actually going to be fairly easy to do. So you can see, all I do is make a clean cut here, cut out a new piece, and then just glue it down. And uh, for the seams, I could do a butt. Just cut this off in a nice sharp 90 degree, and the same on the other side, and glue them up tight. But what I'm going to do is bevel this a little bit. And same on the other, so it'll be sort of like a lap joint when I put this down, and the new piece will overlap the old a little bit, and then I will clamp it really tight. And then I can trim it or sand it, depending on how bad or how much overlap there is. Pretty darn sure this is mahogany. It's so deteriorated, it's kind of hard to tell. What uh, I think I'll do is grab a little lacquer thinner and uh, a rag and just clean the finish completely off in an area to make absolutely sure, because it could be walnut. Which is okay because I've got some walnut as well, but I'm pretty sure it's mahogany. And as for the color, well, very similar to that Admiral I worked on recently. It's a brownish mahogany. I think I might mix things up a little bit with this. I'll see what I've got on hand. I may use a medium brown walnut. I may use Van Dyke walnut or maybe some perfect brown just to make it a little more brown than red. Because I don't see much red in this. Especially on the base, so you can get a better idea of the original color. So they used an opaque lacquer here, and I will as well. So it looks to me like it's just your basic brown. Yes, that is definitely mahogany. I went ahead and squared up a scrap of the salvaged veneer. Put it down in here. 
and as is common of these old veneers it's built up of several pieces originally so if there were any visible seams in this I could try to line up the seam on this with it as well which is right in here but I don't see one down in this area so I'm just going to go with a full piece so this uh, has been back cut or you know, cut, out, cut out of the bevels I mentioned and now I want to cut this back so it overlaps and I'll, I'll leave overhang all around I'll trim that up after the fact once I to get this edge uh, beveled shoot some wood glue on there and then uh, position it and squeeze the heck out of it for a while I'm just about done patching the veneer two main areas I have left are this section here and then the top back edge damage there and here so so saying earlier don't just apply a patch here if you do that the right angle cutting across the grain that will be very obvious remove more of the old veneer even though it seems like you're causing more damage it will make for a better repair in the end and I also cut it at an angle a sharp utility knife here just make a cut there and then I'll pop off the veneer Easily. Yep. Huh. There we go. Yeah, so this doesn't hold too well anymore. Get that back even a little more. And then when I take my patch, I'll trim it the opposite way so it overlaps. A suitable little scrap of old veneer. So I want to clean this up. Got some sandpaper here. So I want the edge that's going to be in the repair to be nice and clean in order to get an angle so the grain lines up. Alright, now I want to feather it. tapered back edge on it. And I want to clean this up a bit and same with the back of this to, to get any old glue off or get it as clean as I can so this isn't quite cut as straight as it could be that had to be perfect in fact um, you want a, a little waviness is actually a good thing so it makes it look more natural alright so that'll work out there snap off a little excess right here I'll trim off the rust after the glue sets up so I'll just put on some glue and push make sure this is pushed up tight so it overlaps a little bit so it's going to stand up a little bit high after it's clamped and glued and set up I'll come back and uh, shave it down take a razor blade and go across this way so take that too Good, make sure all the surfaces are coated. Right. Damp rag, clean off some of the excess glue. Especially when I try to keep this channel clear. 
Otherwise, we'll just have to go back after the fact and clean out that glue that gets down in there. Conveniently, the uh, the width of this slot is uh, just about exactly the exact width of the veneer, so it makes a handy tool to take a veneer scrap and clean that groove out. So I get that position. I'm going to just push it with my fingers for a little bit to get it to set up for a bit, and then take a piece of uh, flat wood like so and clamp it tight. All right, got that clamped. Let that sit for an hour or so, and then I'll trim off the excess. Which just leaves this back strip. Now the type on this set is kind of odd when you look at the edges and that the veneer does not go all the way over the edge. They lift, left this lip here and it's actually uh, kind of flush with this. So the edge of the veneer is actually recessed a little bit. Now cap it's warped in a few spots so it's not quite so recessed. This edge is pretty good but on the other side this veneer is actually standing up a little bit higher than that lip. So if I sand this aggressively, I could actually uh, sand uh, possibly through the veneer at the highest points. You can see here where it came loose. So what I suspect happened is that this wood got damp, just cracked here, and it swelled up a little bit. But you push the veneer up to the point where you get to this back edge, standing completely above this strip. Whereas when you get back down towards here, it's flush. So it's something I need to be careful of. I don't really think there's any way I can mash this down enough that it will get below that. So uh, anyways, um, so I need to repair this back edge and uh, so I was just saying um, you could try putting in an angled patch but I think it would be rather visible so I'm just going to slice all the way across. I've got uh, I think long enough pieces of veneer. This one isn't quite long enough to make the spam, but I've got other scraps. These came from a console that was uh, probably over three feet tall, and I know I've got some scraps that are long enough to make that spam. Here's how it turned out after a little trimming, and I mentioned that I scrape it with a razor blade on edge. And uh, after I strip it and refinish it, you won't be able to tell there was ever any damage there. I have a few small repairs to make to the front of the cabinet. And it's going to be pretty visible, so I want to make them look good. So I don't think I want to just use some wood filler and try to draw on some green lines. So it could cut the, a chunk out going all the way back. But I got something working it to my advantage, which is this frame that screws down. So all I need to do is go back to about here and up to here and over. And then this will cover the seam. This I can just glue down. This same type of deal, go back to here and here. This is pretty small and I don't want to cut a strip out going away across the entire front. So that I think I will just cut out a small patch. It's already irregular and kind of feathered, and I'll just mash it down in there. As I've done before. Corner, well, unfortunately, I kind of chewed off. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to clean it up a little bit. Here's one of those patches applied to the front. So this will be covered up by the frame, and this will blend in nicely once stripped. Alright, the last repair is done. There was a bit of veneer missing here and at this back corner. And at first I was going to cut off like a half inch strip all the way across, but making a nice clean straight line on this curved wooden surface was proving to be a bit of a challenge and it occurred to me much easier to just simply make a small cut here 
and here and just take off this whole back section. And in hindsight, if I'd known I was going to do that, I could have used the veneer I salvaged from here to make little patches like here, but oh well. And then I took out a, uh, or cut up and cleaned up a uh, strip of uh, my salvaged veneer from my other cabinet, and it's all glued and secured. Now, this is what you see here. Well, after I glued it and clamped it, I wanted to make sure it was bonded really well, so I went over it with an iron, but I didn't want to put the iron directly on this wood. I didn't want to scorch it, so I used to put a paper towel in between, but well, the heat melted uh, the old finish a bit, or perhaps some wax or something else that was on it, and the paper toweling is stuck to it a little bit. No big deal. When I strip this, it'll come off. And that is the next step to strip, and uh, the weather's gotten uh, nice and cool, so I can work up in the attic without uh, roasting alive. And then I'm going to strip this. Oh, also while stripping it, I noticed... Uh, on this side where the finish was in better condition that clearly the bottom is a darker color than this. Now I, I did order up some lacquer on hand. I got brown mahogany and Van Dyke and medium brown walnut. Well, uh, I needed some supplies and uh, for other projects upcoming so I attacked on some perfect brown as well. So I have uh, like four different types of brown I can use. So I can either put on an extra coat of toner here to make it darker or use a different color toner. But uh, the point is I want to make this a different color than this. And I think that color difference is supposed to wrap around to that control strip that goes on the front here. Thought some of you might find this little tool interesting. This is a veneer saw. Use this for trimming off the edge of veneer. So flat on one side and sharp teeth on either of the other sides. And it will ride against the side of your cabinet. And I mixed up a little 50-50 acetone and lacquer thinner and applied it to the back of the cabinet to get a preview of how well these veneers are going to match and I think it's going to be a pretty darn good match. Old salvaged stuff other than a really tight seam along in here. You'd never know that wasn't the original. Now back to the electrical side of things for a moment. So, the tuner. Here is the cap that I pulled out and I replaced it with a two picofarad cap. That seems to work okay, but I would like to get things as close to original as possible. So let's take a look at the schematic and see where that capacitor is actually used. I picked up a uh, hard copy of the uh, SAM service info. The photocopy I got was great and helped me get this thing working uh, but uh, I found a, an original cheap so I figured why not. And something curious you can see on this. See there's a DX above the screen and I've seen that on some of the other uh, tabletop models as well that have this type chassis. See, there's a 196 DX. However mine does not have a DX on the safety glass. It's curious. So I wonder what exactly have I got? Is it a transition model between the original and the DX? Is a chassis from a different set that got swapped into this cabinet? Was the safety glass replaced at some point? Sure, I'll never know. All right, so here is the schematic of the tuner and there is the capacitor right there, 0.47. So RF amp, mixer, this in between and coming off of either side of the capacitor is a switchable coil. So this is a pi filter. Pi bandpass filter. Coil, capacitor, coil. So switchable coil and that's actually really just one long coil with taps that short it out as you go up and down. So lower frequency, more inductance, move down the chain. But also notice at a couple points you switch in a 0.47 in parallel with that guy and here a 1.5. 
Well, I'm going to double check on the picture. See, is this really C18 or C19? At any rate, by my replacing it with a larger capacitance value, I've thrown off this bandpass action. However, the set does work. That's because the channel is really selected by the local oscillator mixing with his incoming signal. If this bandpass filters off, what it's going to do is it's going to reduce the gain. It's limiting the signal coming through here. But since I'm supplying such a clean, powerful signal from like my converter box, it's still making its way through. And I'm working at the lower frequencies as well, where you have more capacitance anyway. So this altering, it's already in parallel with these two. So we've already got about two picofarad. And um, so all three lumped together for like channel three, it'd be two and a half picofarad. I've added an additional one and a half, so it's throwing things off, but it still seems to work okay. So let's see if we can find a picture. I know they have one in here. The tuner, and there's the capacitor. Right there. And that's C18. Back to the schematic. C18. Yeah, so it is this one. So this is the one that's always in the circuit and affects every channel. Now I've used this and gone from channels 2 to 13 all the way through and with this tuner. And they all receive okay. But uh, I have to imagine it'll work better with the correct value capacitor. Okay, so where do I get the correct value capacitor? Well, modern stuff, all I can find are surface mounts, which I'm willing to try. Um, and they're cheap enough. I found some of my mouths that are like 10 cents each, so I'll figure I'll order up 10 or so, because I figure I'm going to have some failures, because I'm going to have to attach some itty-bitty wires to it. And I imagine the package, I think it's a 1206, which is memory serves, is pretty darn small, so <laughs> it could require some effort. Or, hey, maybe I can find some in my stash, and I do have some of the type you'd use in tuners, these ceramic guys. Just don't have any small enough, though. I have some still in their package, 6.8, which has a little indicator that tells me how to read these. So when I found this, which wasn't in a package, it seems to me that that's a 4.7. In other words, 10 times what I need, and that's the best I could find. And these are the type you got to use, or, you'd, or ideally you'd use these tubular ceramic or mica, because these are super stable when it comes to uh, temperature variations. And NPO, modern, uh, more modernly they refer to a CG0, it means they really don't change in capacitance with temperature. You can see the tolerance on these does is plus minus 0.5, and I'm looking for a 0.5. And on those, the tolerances I'm saying are like plus minus 0.1 picofarad. Because it's really, really hard to make a capacitor that small in value. So maybe you suggest making a gimmick, just taking two pieces of insulated wire and twisting them together. It's a possibility. I do suspect, though, that that would vary somewhat in uh, capacitance with temperature and it'd be tough for me to have it in the tuner because it goes way up in there and be adjusting the twists um, while feeding a signal through to observe the effect. So I had another thought. Why don't I salvage one from another set because I've got some salvage tuners especially from Adam Rolls. So I pulled out the schematic for those and for some, some, for some RCA and what I saw again and again and again they do not have any fixed capacitors of very small value. I'm sure it's because they're so hard to manufacture accurately. What they use, variable capacitor, variable capacitor, variable capacitor. The smallest I've seen is a 5 picofarad, or one-tenth of what I'm looking for. And even then they put it in parallel with a little trimmer. These are like little piston type uh, capacitors. Very low capacitance and uh, easy to adjust. And then they used to fix inductors for the most part. Uh, so I'm sure they realize that, hey, if you want to make an accurate bandpass filter, you <laughs> don't rely on the capacitor being accurate to make it variable so you can tweak these things. And when you look in the service info for this Westinghouse set, when it comes to the tuner, there is no info in adjusting it. There are no adjustments to be made. They say it was calibrated at the factory and don't mess with it. Which again, it makes me kind of wonder, as crazy as it looks, crazy as it may sound, could this have been intentionally filed down? It kind of sure looks like it. It doesn't look like it like was hit by lightning and like blew out the side. It looks like it was cut down. 
Now how these work, I'm not exactly sure. There sure isn't going to be like a jelly roll of foil and layers of insulator dielectric because the capacitor is so small. It's probably just like a piece of metal one end to the other and a ceramic in between. And by trimming it away, it seems to me you could alter the value of the capacitance. However, you're exposing it to the elements, it's going to probably absorb moisture and such, which could screw things up. Without having any way to know, and this is just too small for me to measure accurately with anything I've got. When I hook it up to a capacitance meter, basically there's no change. The leads have more stray capacitance than this thing is going to indicate. Um, could also just put this back in the tuner and see how it works. I don't know. Ah, oh, that's not the easiest thing to keep swapping in and out. But I figure I'll give the modern ones a try. So I'm going to order some up. And they'll arrive in a week or so, and I'll give them a try.